So another example of the sharing economy we've talked about a few times so far, and we're going to continue to t touch on this afternoon, is cars. Cars are expensive. Not everyone has them. How many people here have a car? Put your hand up. How many people here would share their car with someone else? How many people here would share a ride with a stranger in their car? Interesting. One of the great things about the sharing economy and the platforms we're building around that is trust and reputation, and the fact that those types of features allow us to feel more confident to actually engage in those kinds of activities. One of the startups that's involved in this space is Blah Blah Car, and I'm delighted that Frederick Mazella, one of the founders, is here to talk more about his startup. Please welcome him on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we are going to talk about the hippie dreams and digital trust. Hippies were actually entrepreneurs. They wanted to change the world. They wanted to make it a better place. They had dreams. They had visions. They had very, very good ideas. Among those ideas was hitchhiking. Hitchhiking was great because you could go anywhere, anytime, for unbeatable prices or even for free, and you would have the feeling of saving the planet too. And you would meet great people. We all know people who've hitched. They all have great stories to tell. Your parents, my parents, sometimes us, me. We met great people. We discovered new cultures. We discovered new places. It was fabulous. It was freedom. So when I heard that the theme of this conference was the digital hippies, I was like, yes, we're going to relaunch this whole movement, this whole hippie movement again. So what do you think? Shall we relaunch this whole hippie movement? What do you think? Whoa, 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 Fred. Oh, come Nicholas. On, come on. Uh, Nicholas, you're here. Please welcome my exceptional co-founder and reality checker, Nicholas Bresson. Thank you. Thank you. So, I guess let's talk about reality for a minute, right? I think none of you guys want to be hippies like your parents. And I think in reality, hitchhiking kind of failed, actually. And in many ways, it failed for lots of good reasons. I mean, I'm not sure I would give these guys a ride to whatever, Willie's picnic. But you're right, Fred, hitchhiking was a good idea. But in many ways, it was the story of a good idea with probably poor execution and bad execution, maybe bad timing. But if you think of it, the idea was brilliant, right? I mean, this concept of taking the car, which is, in a way, a very private space, and turning that into some kind of public transport, you know, unlocking these empty seats for public transport, was brilliant. But I think we all understand here that good ideas are not sufficient, right? I mean, we all work for startup tech companies, we all want to change the world. I mean, we have new ideas about new products, new technologies, new business model, new companies, I guess. And you know, we all understand that good ideas only materialize when you have good execution, good timing. But probably there is something else we understand, right, if we've been doing that for a while. We also understand that good ideas and good concepts tend to come back, right? And hitchhiking was a good concept. And they tend to come back in different shape or form, different time, different location, with different teams. Um, and um, hitchhiking is no different in a way. You know, it's bound to, to come back. But you know, let's first focus on what failed. So you know, before we can sort of create the rebirth of hitchhiking in some ways, we need to understand what went wrong. And I think it boils down to three main reasons. First of all, it was untrusted. Right? If you think of hitchhiking, you had no information about the driver, no information about the passenger, no exchange of trust or information between the members of that community in a way, which is pretty hard. It was also very disorganized, very chaotic, very unplanned. I mean, as a, as a driver, when you were doing hitchhiking, you had no idea how many passengers you're going to pick up, if you're going to pick up passengers, what's going to happen. Nothing was planned in advance, right? So it was all very spontaneous and a bit chaotic, a bit random. And last but not least, it was unpaid, 
right? So, I mean, the whole concept, I guess, behind hitchhiking, that's what my dad was telling me, actually, when he, when he told me that he traveled all over Europe for free. Uh, the concept was hitchhikers were actually not paying. So there was not much of a financial incentive very quickly for drivers to actually do that, right? Um, so in many ways, hitchhikers were like free riders. They were just free riding on that system. So if you think of a marketplace or a, a, a community where you have people free riding, no one to organize it, no planning, no trust, and no exchange of, of information, it's kind of bound to fail in many ways, right? And that's sort of what happened to hitchhiking, and that's why it never took off at, uh, a, a, at a big scale. And in many ways, it's just that the hippies probably were doing that maybe at the wrong time to some extent in terms of technology, with the wrong tools, with the wrong processes. So, in a way, you know, good ideas tend to come back, right? And if you think of it, that's what happened to hitchhiking, or the notion of hitchhiking, hitchhiking is coming back through what today we call ride-sharing. And ride-sharing, or intercity, I should say, ride-sharing, or long-distance ride-sharing. And in a way, it's different because it's about sharing, and not just sharing a journey, but also sharing the cost of that journey. So if we pause on that slide, actually, for, um, for a few minutes, because it's, uh, I mean, the numbers are not random, today in this country, if you drive from London to Manchester, that's 200 miles, it's actually going to cost you 80 pounds, 100 plus dollars, right? It's going to cost you that in terms of like petrol, depreciation of the vehicle, maintenance of the vehicle, taxis, da da da. All these things add up to 80 pounds. So if you think that in some ways you could organize yourself in advance to find three passengers actually going the same way, also wanting to do a London Manchester as a journey, you could collect 60 pounds on your way, you could completely offset your cost of motoring, and you create a strong incentive for the driver. And not only that, but by doing that, the driver is unlocking three empty seats for passengers going the same way. And in a way, the driver is creating a new transport network based on sharing. So here we are, right? I mean, we are in the sharing economy. It's not about free riding anymore. It's about sharing a cost and, and creating a new transport network. So, you know, I guess to make that possible, obviously, we had to reinvent the whole thing, right? I mean, we had to use today's technology and today's tool to make that available. And obviously, it would not be like someone standing on the side of the road and you know, waiting for a car to stop by. So we had to do that with all the stuff we have today. Obviously, the internet, mobile phones, social graph, APIs with maps, and all that stuff, right? And all of that, in many ways, helped us to solve all the problems, all the flows of hitchhiking that sort of made hitchhiking, in a way, fail back in the days. So today, you can do prepayment online, on mobile. You can plan in advance. You can get trust in your community, and we'll talk about that quite a lot. Uh, through ratings, through the social graph, through you know, lots of social information. And not only that, but you can make all of that available instantly through mobile phones. So today you don't need to stand on the side of the road. You can get all this information very, very quickly. So what I wanted to show, I mean, just uh, essentially what we wanted to do is to share some data about our, our community because that's the only thing we have access to and it's pretty... Um, uh, you know, I, I guess it's pretty representative of what's going on with intercity ride-sharing in Europe. And, and I guess there are two, two things to take away from that slide. I mean, A, it's, it's a very new phenomenon. So in a way, the rebirth of hitchhiking through ride-sharing uh, in Europe is, is very new. It's really took off, as you can see, in the last two, three years, perhaps. Uh, but it's already very significant, right? So if you look at these uh, numbers of passengers transported, last year, 2012, we had three million passengers choosing online ride-sharing over driving their own car, or taking the train, or taking a plane, or maybe taking a long-distance coach. And with the numbers we see this year, it should be about 10 million passengers choosing to travel through online ride-sharing, sharing ride between cities all over Europe. So it is pretty significant. And in a way, what's really interesting about that is, at least in Europe, we're building this new transport network, right? That's going to be alongside the train, the bus, the plane, and all the other things. And that transport network today, so that's, um, that, that was uh, last month, is transporting 600,000 passengers per month, right? So but that's very significant. And to put that in, uh, in perspective, uh, and for you guys who probably took the Eurostar, some of them, to come here, the Eurostar is doing 900,000 passengers per month. So it means online ride-sharing is going to be bigger in Europe than the Eurostar, which was like a billion euros, several billion euros of investment. Um, so it is pretty significant. It's also, very interestingly, a very European phenomenon, in a sense that this intercity um, online ride-sharing has not really taken off in the US, 
Uh, so I guess for people from the US, it might sound like something new when you know, it's been going on in Europe for, for a few years. And, and today, it's just spreading like wildfire uh, all over Europe. And, uh, and to give you a sense of scale, which is uh, an interesting number, more than 3 billion kilometers have been shared on the road uh, by these communities. So I guess with that in mind, Fred, it sounds like the dream is becoming a reality. Yeah, thank you. It seems, indeed, the dream is becoming a reality. And so I'll come back with dreams, actually. But let's step back a little bit to understand what really happened um, and how this whole growth that we've seen has been made possible. Actually, we understood over the years that it had been made possible thanks to the trust we had created among the community and the trust that the community had for the service we were providing. So we articulated all the components of trust we have deployed over the years in order to build this trust at scale. And today, we'd like to share with you an important framework, a brand new framework for the sharing economy that it took us years to put up. It's the DREAMS framework. The name is very well chosen for this conference and for the DREAMS that we've been talking about. So it's the new trust framework for the sharing economy. It states that the information that users on the sharing economy service should have access to has to have six characteristics. It has to be declared, rated, engaged, activity-based, moderated, and social. We'll work through the framework and we'll see how we can implement that. The information has to be declared. It means that when the people register on the service, they declare basic information. This has been around forever on the web. It's nothing new, but it's the information that people will put up, like their name, their picture, their short bio, and their preferences. They'll say if they smoke or not, for example, in a car in the house. They'll say if they accept animals or not, what kind of music they listen to. They'll also say how much they talk sometimes, like for, uh, for example, on blah, blah car, you choose whether you blah, 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 or blah, blah, blah. This helps the trip to go further and easier. So then the information you have access to must be rated. It must be rated by the peers in the network. It hires the level of trust. When you see someone with a profile who has 14 positive ratings, then you want to go in that car. It's actually brand new information because ratings have been around forever on the web. Uh, we've had ratings since eBay, TripAdvisor, or uh, Amazon. But the ratings we have access to here in the sharing economy are completely different. They're actually ratings uh, from people, about people, expressing a trust. Those people have met in the real life, and that makes a whole difference. Then the information you have access to must be engaged. By engaged, we mean that you need some proof of commitment. You need some proof that the other person is actually serious about doing this transaction. Usually, this is achieved through online payments, online prepayments of the transactions. Like if you go on Airbnb, you will book your room before. If you go on our website, you will book your trip before. And it's the same for all the sharing economy services. Then it has to be activity-based. The information is contextual. It means, anyway, it's very obvious, because when you go on a website, you know what you're here for. So you will see the context, whether it's home stays, it's car sharing, ride sharing, task sharing with TaskRabbit, or all the services that you'll be able to do the information you have access to is in that context, because a good driver could turn out to be a bad host, and a good host could turn out to be a bad passenger, or dirty, or late, I don't know. So you have to have the information that is contextual. Then, and it's the most important part for the service itself, the information has to be moderated. It means that the team who's managing the service for the sharing economy has to background check all the phone numbers, emails, bank details, and also sometimes the postal addresses, all the IDs. And also you have to approve and moderate all the content that is published on the website so that it is a high level of quality and it inspires trust. And finally, the last pillar of trust we found out is that the information has to be social you have to have a profile which is connected with the other social networks. You want to know that you are dealing with a real person who has friends on Facebook and 
professional connections on LinkedIn. It is very important because it makes you feel that you are actually interacting with a real person. So with this framework in mind, we can come back to the growth that we have seen before. And actually, what happened in the early years, of course, we didn't know about that. We didn't know that uh, trust was so important and that it had so many components we needed to deploy one after the other. So, but in the early days, we had only three components of trust. We had the declared information, because it's basic, activity-based, because we knew what we were doing. We still know what we are doing, but we knew at that time also. And it was moderated, because soon after we launched, we realized that we actually had to moderate everything so that everything looks clean. And then, starting in 2009, we added the ratings, because it was asked by the community. And so, the ratings helped us grow a little bit further, a little bit faster. And then, in 2012, we actually implemented the rest of the DREAMS model. We implemented engagements through online prepayment, and we implemented the social angle of the activity by connecting our profile to the Facebook. So, I guess the real question now today is, where do we stand with digital trust? How much trust have we been able to generate in the community? So maybe, Nico, you can tell us a little bit so, about that. So you're right. It's an interesting question, right? So, so what we've done and what we'd like to, to share with you guys today is we've done a survey actually on our community to try to understand the different level of trust we could generate between different groups. And basically what we've done was just asking a very basic question to, um, to lots of our members and, and collecting, the, collecting the data. And that question was, what's your trust level for different groups of people? So we started with, as you can see, like strangers, and then neighbors, Facebook friends, colleagues, and friends and family. And the thing was framed in such a way that you know, one was sort of very low rating, and five was sort of maximum rating. So, uh, ma maximum trust, sorry. So, you know, basically, and not surprisingly, you can see strangers rate very low, at 2.2. And if you think back of hitchhiking back in the days, those are strangers, right? So, so they would have a very low level of trust in the community. Neighbors, Facebook friends, and colleagues tend to be between 3.5 and 4. And then I guess the gold standard, I mean, the guys you trust the most, your friends and family, would be 4.7. So clearly that's probably the maximum you can achieve uh, in our community. And then we ask that question for a full, complete profile on our community, on Blah, Blah Car, what we call the, uh, the dreams profile. And, and the result was very, very staggering, very interesting, right? Because it shows that if you collect, if you, ha if you have this accumulation of trust signals, all the stuff that Fred described, you get to 4.2. Right? So it means people in that community give as much, if not more, trust to uh, a full profile on a community than a neighbor or a Facebook friend or, or a colleague. So that's pretty powerful, and I'm sure there are lots of things we can do with that, right? Well, actually, uh, I'm sure there are lots of things we can do with that. We don't know all of them already. Um, we actually think that this is a brand new strength, a new power for the next generation and ours. We will be able to use that to build bigger things, and actually, maybe we can continue a little bit the dream and, and think that we had, in our studies, we've seen many, many uh, models like this. We've seen the SWOT analysis, we've seen the 2 by 2 BCG matrix, you remember that? Uh, we've seen the four Ps in marketing, uh, we've seen the five forces of Porter for strategy, and maybe today we actually found the six pillars of trust for the sharing economy. I don't know. Or maybe the whole thing is just a pipe dream. I don't know. Maybe. The only thing we're sure about is that we are the generation who is able to build a brand new trust for the next century. And actually, we are all, we are all digital hippies, and we can make this happen. So let's make this happen together. Thank you. Thank you.